Three years have elapsed since the inception of the Rust clan scene. What began as an assembly of uninitiated, naive individuals who gathered in small and assuming groups would eventually grow into formidable clans that shook the very bedrock of Rust itself. Only a select few would rise with the right to lead these colossal forces as the most respected leaders of their generation. Yet, as the relentless hourglass of time drained away, the foundations of their empires began to crumble. The few who ruled with an iron fist began to vanish into the abyss. In their absence, anarchy and chaos reigned as their previous loyal followers began to stake their claim as the new rulers of this generation. They all now stood at arms to fight for that claim in the most monumental battle Rust has ever witnessed, where fate could only decide one true victor. None could have foreseen the vital impact this event would have, but it was destined to alter the very course of the clan scene, and Rust itself. Now the moment has come, the stage is set, and it's about time we answered who would win. On November 18th of 2017, we would see this historic battle take place in the frozen wasteland of the most populated clan server at the time being Rustified Maine in North America. The build-up for such a battle had been in the works over many years with our three leaders. Nico, who was the successor of Dirt McGirt, formerly the best clan leader in North America, with his group, DMG, until his departure in 2016, where Nico would be bold in becoming a leader of his first team, known as Infamy, taking his knowledge to build the best possible team in the clan scene. Nickley45, the leader of Nickley Knights, was also a former member of DMG and had diverted to a different path and was cruel in his forms of success by code raiding and betraying his previous friends and would now see Nico to be his greatest threat. Finally, Kin, the leader of Dot Clan, notorious for his hateful demeanor within and outside of Rust, had been the only remaining clan who had challenged DMG in the 2015 era and saw Nico as the last remaining clan to defeat and taking control over the server. With a constant barrage of failed raids on Infamy from Nickley Knights and Doc Clan, it was clear if they wanted to succeed in taking control over the clan scene, they would need to eliminate Nico from their plans. Thousands of hours of time investment from the most competitive players would now show to many if those hours were well used. Nickley Knights and Doc Clan began their siege. Nico had yet to be raided by these groups, and now if all of them coming together with such a force of might, it would show if he truly had what it took to be one of the greatest clan leaders of his generation. Rockets fired at every second of the fight, and everyone from the entire server came to witness this unbelievable feat. Hundreds of players were killed in battle, but as NK and Dot got closer to the core, it looked like they might have a chance. But as Grub surrounded NK and Dot Clan, and Infamy approached from their walls, the rockets appeared less frequent, and the sounds of gunfire ceased to appear. For the thousands of bodies that laid idle, next to the scrapnel of guns and rockets that had taken real-world days to farm, Nico would overlook the wreckage from his fortress still standing. He had just survived the biggest raid in the history of the Rust Clan scene. When you're at the top of the type of servers that Main was, everybody wants a piece of that team. My co-lead was Itchy, also known as Jesse. When I wasn't there, led the charge so people didn't get demotivated. Acre, the best crafter and organizer. Ganji was probably the craziest builder in the game back then. Without those three people, this raid defense, but also most of the success that we had, just wouldn't have been the same. Twenty eighteen could be described as the golden era of the main scene, as all the clans now knew each other, their histories, and shared empathy for the biggest losses witnessed and pride for the well deserved wins. The main scene's legends stretched beyond the confines of Rustified Maine, with rumors of these clans resonating throughout the entire Rust community. Following this titanic clash of Infamy vs. Dot and NK, Rust leaderboards began their establishment in almost every region of the game now giving clans the opportunity to see who is doing the best or worst each week in a detailed write-up, leading to the biggest dramas and scandals to ever scorch the scene. And with competition and interest for clans being at an all-time high, everyone was secretly craving to be in that number one spot. With the fall of Dot and NK, many speculated about the next worthy adversary for the now-revered Infamy clan. Many eyes turned to the oil team. Under the original leadership of Limit, one of Rust's most respected PvP players, despite OT's modest numbers, they were rapidly gaining notoriety for their aggressive roaming and PvP prowess. Tanza, the leader as of 2023, recounts his encounter against Dot. When Dot clan tried to raid us, so we got our own 60 rockets from that, so... 
we decided to go raid dot back full online because uh, as some of you may know OT didn't raid much at this time because we, we didn't have people so this was one of the only times uh, we actually got to raid with uh, like large amount of rockets because we got them from dot you can see kid in the chat with the question mark what meanwhile I'm breaching their core don't know what he's thinking about but I'm about to have their TC right now I destroyed dot with my 15 FPS dot couldn't get back in anymore and we won the raid In this era, you had the notable F1K, with their leader Cassie, who was respected for his consistency and never giving up, would try to follow in Nico's footsteps. Another clan, Men at Work, led by Blazy, showcased an impressive ascent, but their departure from the scene was as swift as their arrival. DML, steered by the controversial leader Steph, gained notoriety for their trolling and provoking reactions out of all the clans. As the year unfolded, IB emerged as the formidable frontrunner, guided by Prometheus and OG, showed extreme coordination in the worst of situations, and were notable for their chaotic comms. IB was often repped by 4018, captivating the community with his thrilling gambling streams and reactions. But at the time, Nico, not having found a worthy opponent since his remarkable victory, became bored with the state of Rustified Maine, and decided to do one of Rust's very first clan rolled tours, revisiting his old battlegrounds of Rusty Moose and Rustopia, hoping to find Find a formidable challenger. This would give the opportunity for other clans on the home server of Rustified Maine some time to gain some more experience in his absence. Unsurprisingly, there was not much of a challenge, with a majority of these clans being on Rustified Maine. Other clans from Rustopia and Rusty Moose were less battle-scarred. Having faced fewer challenges, they lacked the strategic depth and commitment of a behemoth like Infamy. Veteran groups like Pharaoh's Group, k the Wanderer's Group, and XO, who had once rivaled CML and DMG in 2015, were shadows in this evolving era. Similar to a rustified CPA clan, under Dunzen's leadership, which had once reigned supreme in 2016, had also faded from the scene. Their absence meant a loss of invaluable expertise, leaving the new generation struggling to find their footing in the ever-expanding main scene. With a pristine title and such a track record, Nico decided it would be best to retire the title of Infamy, in honor of the players who made it all happen. AE or A Eaters would be their new title, and would go to be a staple of what many new generation players would remember Nico's team by today. In the midst of the newly branded AE returning to Rustified, there was a new opponent on the playing field, who was also experiencing their first world tour. NM, no mercy with the resounding leaders of Tacular and Tesla, from the Oceana clan scene in Rustralasia. Tacular, had found his love for clans through Sin, one of the best teams for 2016 in Oceana, and would grow to have incredible capabilities on the battlefield. With his newfound skill, he would decide to join TGB, one of the greatest Oceana clans for 2017. This is where he would meet another great player, known as Tesla. A strong bond grew between both of these individuals for their interest in the main scene. Tesla, being one of the core leaders of TGB for almost a year, felt after some time he wanted to do something on his own. Tacular would join him, and together they would found a small group known as IO, Invite Only. In learning the ropes of their new team, they squared off against former comrades, TGB and Sin. The Legion shift was not well received, as their former clan leaders got very upset that their best members decide to turn against them. With the success of their newfound group, they would adopt the tag of NM, which represented their response to their once allies and friends. Many of the greatest Rustralasia players took notice and opted to join their group, where they would go to raid many notable clans every wipe day. We had dominated Australia, as fucking ego-filled as that sounds. We raided, I think it was Sin, and we pumped the side of their base, got into the rocket box straight away, grabbed the rockets, which was arguably the best loot. We ran out of the base. In 30 seconds or less, Sin didn't even have a single clue what was going on. And we raided four other groups with their rockets that same day and then swapped servers. It was... it was insane. <laughs> Tacular and Tesla felt like they had made it. In search of another ladder to climb, they would hear about the recent events of Infamy and felt this was their next stepping stone to move their players to the next level. Arriving at 4pm Oceana time to play Rust Relasia, they would make efforts to have their best possible wipe, only to arrive bright and early to play Rustified Main for a 6am start. Their control and dominance they had possessed several hours earlier had quickly vanished, as the veterans of Rustified Main had a lot more experience and tactic to outrival their new Australian friends. Tacular and Tesla would take notice, and began using their time zones to their advantage, offlining many of the groups who rivaled them, but would be struck back with similar force. It wasn't until several weeks later that they would successfully defend from Question Mark Clan, which was better known as PP, 
PP had been one of the original PvP focus groups playing as far back as 2015, and was founded by Julio and Rikolov. They took off with their return in 2017, where they would be an antagonist to Infamy, being one of the few groups to successfully raid them in July of 2017, four times in a row. It's like David versus Goliath in terms of raiding, because we would always be like 12 members to 14 maximum. I'd say one of the highlights was uh, managed to get back at AE and Nico after he would enjoy offlining us quite often and raiding them at prime time using explosive ammo, which wasn't really heard of back then. That made for quite a good video and a lot of people enjoyed that one. In 2018, GC would form with the transfer of many PP core members, where they would continue to rival the best of main scene, with the addition of top players in two of the best European teams at the time, SES with their leader Stenwai and CL run by Haddock. They would create an elite PvP focused team. It was also during this time where Tacular and Tesla befriended Nico in the late spring of 2018, where AE expanded their team with the new founding pro Aussie members in the third iteration of Nico's group called Notorious. This turned Nico's group into an unstoppable force to be reckoned with, as with the very best of AU on their side, it was now practically impossible to have a successful raid attempt, as there was always players online, and they were sure to let you know you were being watched. As the battles of these clans unfolded, a popular clan YouTuber of the name of Grimble took center stage. He caught the community's attention, not for his skill and game, but rather for his controversial behavior, highlighted in a video revealing an often misunderstood aspect of clan culture. I'm fucking dead! You fucking retard! Oh my god! Is anyone gonna answer my fucking question? Why does no one listen? Like... Fuck! Holy fuck! Fucking idiots, bro! As the clips spread around of Grimble's behavior, notable clan members from groups such as Infamy began to play with Grimble to troll him for a reaction. Grimble would eventually quit Rust, likely due to this backlash and exposure, but would have one final encounter with none other than Tacular and Tesla, who felt disgraced in seeing Grimble use the same clan tag as NM. NM gave Grimble the opportunity to change his tag out of respect for Tacular and Tesla. He strongly declined, but to his surprise, there would be consequences for his actions. You sit here and keep watching, and you watch the people that are good at the game, hence why you're in my fucking stream. So I'm getting off, I have shit to do, you're a beta bitch, later. After these events, Grimble slowly faded out of rust. It was clear to many that Grimble was probably not a bad guy, and just wanted to be a good clan leader. But for how far the game had progressed, it was also obvious to see the battle scars of these players, for how they were treated, and for how they learned to treat others. A great example of this was Robin, who led Cloud, famously orchestrated alliances only to betray them in an Order 66 style twist. <coughs> dang dang! Robin's cunning tactics didn't go unnoticed, as he was soon recruited by Nico in their For Free brand under the name of Naughty Boys, bolstering Nico's roster of formidable players. But there was one player who refused to join any clan, and was now one of the only real fears to these players. It was none other than Cisco the Grub. Do you know something called Grubs? You change your names and try to like infiltrate their base. Really? They yeah. don't do anything I but think, scam I think Cisco, plans. I don't know if you know Cisco, but I think he's a leader. I know I Cisco. Know. Previously mentioned for his efforts in helping Rust leaderboards, had now gone out to enjoy his summer and taking loot from every clan on the server, of Nico's clan being his prime target. Cisco never used a microphone, which made him even more mysterious for players. What had started as a small newsletter in 2017 through Shepherd's Villa, a small hotel on Rustified Main, had now expanded into a massive media conglomerate through the summer of 2018. Rust leaderboards came to rise as a hotspot for information on this emerging clan economy, showcasing the very best of Oceania via Shepherd's Oasis, Europe for Shepherd's Inn, and North America for Shepherd's Villa. With the clan community reaching a total of 10,000 active participants, clans had never been in a better place. Complementing this competitive spirit was unknown, or universally known as UKN. A name train server by Six My Bad would come into play. It emerged as a contender after combat tags faltered, and the growing pains with the new meta of aim train servers, a dispute began with Rustoria, where Six My Bad was removed from his project in favor of Rustoria Training Grounds, or RTG, which would be ran by Hopple, a member of PP. Six My Bad would not let the same mistakes happen again, persistent to return with a game mode server like nothing seen before. The specter of cheating reared its head yet again. This time it was commercialized, and the use of Bloody Mouse, 
where players quickly discovered the newly added features to this mouse to streamline their accuracy over any weapon's recoil. This quickly took the community by storm, with thousands of purchases of this mice to have that competitive edge. Now to test on the freshly made aim train servers. From perfect aim train or PAT to UKN and RTG, another form of competitive edge came into play. The famous Zeko peak became a staple strategy. By positioning two high walls strategically, players could create a vantage point, easy to shoot from, but almost impossible to be targeted. This was widely used by Sliced and Mantis from Easy Easy Team, where they took advantage of a younger player who was new to the main scene called Zeko. He would go on to have a terrible time playing on Aim Train, and in a fit of rage went to messaging the owners of these servers to ban Easy Easy from using this mechanic. Wahoo, the owner of PAT, would go to tell Zeko, if you can't beat them, join them. Zeko would take this to heart and would now spend the remainder of this year head glitching and ruining scrims for other players. Reflecting the abuse he suffered, the Zeko P can still be heard about today. Some other popular metas of there were things such as the rise of ghosting. Without the use of a team UI system, and even after implementation, players would commonly use tags for members such as Dot, AE, and IB lurking outside of doors to siphon off loot. The servers being vanilla, a common theme if you were truly the best on the server was the presence of foundation rating, where the goal was no longer to raid a base, but to completely obliterate it. As the year wrapped up, the core of PP eventually decided to merge with Infamy, where Nico would have his final integration of his clan this year, called ZZZ, or better known as Sleepy Boys. It was not a question to anyone that ZZZ was one of the best clans of 2018. For the players they trained, and for the members that supported their efforts in dominating the North American main scene, other top contenders would be considered to be Oil Team, run by Tonza, after the absence of Limit, Ishbin or IB run by Prometheus and OG, and PP run by Rikolov, who police what the main scene should be. Joining any of these groups during this era was a great achievement for any clan players, as you knew you were truly playing with the very best Rust had to offer. In Europe, you would see the last battles from SES, still a great team, became less frequent in their journey, likely tired from their start since 2015. PP could be considered to be one of the best EU groups across the board, but they only made a short appearance as they mainly played on North American servers. The best team in European main scene could be considered to be Purge, run by Kanji, a popular European PvP creator at the time, learned how to take the reins, making his group one of the best of 2018. Regrettably, Rust Relasia started to see a decline, with the departure of NM for Tacular and Tesla, one of Oceana's best teams for 2018, and the notable absence of figures like Durka from Sin, General from TGB, the scene's enthusiasm began to waver, as the clan economy had their first recession. The early signs of the impending recession were evident in the lost archives of the Rust leaderboards, as a disgruntled leader known as BPOC from RGN made an assault on Shepard's Villa, and wiping a year's worth of history and abusing the Discord moderation policies, along with many other anarchists who wanted to remove the clan scene within Rust in November of 2018. The newly found Shepard's Oasis for the Oceana clan scene was overtaken by Wicked, and Shepard's Inn for the European clan scene was reformed into the EU community, run by the notable Pete95. Nico, who was one once an advocate of the villa had gone against the system he once enjoyed to start Wokeville, where he would decide who is worthy of interacting with some of the best clans in North America with his newfound power built from 2018. Unfortunately, with the decline of news on the clan scene, segregation would begin to reform for the regions that were once gapped with media like Rust leaderboards. Now, many new clans and players would lose out on the opportunity to learn what the main scene really was. But with everything being so great in the moment, everyone overlooked the signs of decline, for the tragedy unfolding, assuming what they had built would last forever. Things looked bright for the main scene in the beginning of 2019. Coming out of the previous golden era, clans persisted across all the regional servers now. The updates and progress Rust was undergoing were welcomed by many. Clan content was on an upwards trend, and the scene's popularity soared. Felt like the sky was the limit. The player Viper would be a great example of this rise. In starting a small clan called Scissors, he was exposed to leaderboards during their peak in 2018, and had often thought about what it would be like to be the best. In playing in Dot, a group run by the notorious leader Kin, and experiencing Clad with the humorous leader Robin, was intrigued by the clan community, and wished to become a top contender for the teams he had admired. By late 2018, he made significant strides, launching the 5k group that introduced standout players like Etone to the main scene, and set his eyes out to play on the now widely popular clan servers of Rusty Moose, 
and rustified North America. On his first wipe, within a few hours, he would be raided by Nico. Viper was not that easy to give in, and would try to come back to rebuild again, only to be raided. This persisted for several months, but unlike most groups who would be quick to give up or switch servers, 5k persisted and got immensely better in the process, to the point where Nico feared raiding them. Definitely the biggest commitment in the main scene in general is you have to have a good core that enjoy playing the game together. Even if you're doing the worst, I think that's the reason we pushed through even though we kept getting raided is we all enjoyed playing the game. 5k began to retaliate in winning fights against IB, OT, F1k, and ZZZ, where they would grow to become a staple of the main scene. Alongside 5k, you had Unicorn from Dot Dell, who was a former officer in Checkmark Clan, led by Tank in 2017. Dot Dell was notable for bringing in some of the best players into the main scene, such as Maxa, who became a popular clan YouTuber, serving alongside ZZZ and well known for his success with his team, Burst Gang. Unicorn would also be involved in the discovery of socket stacking, which was founded by Salty from IB, where it became immensely difficult to raid through roofs. This was widely used, becoming a favorite among main scene veterans, reminiscent of the 2015 to 2016 era, where everything could be stacked. Under the leadership of Cassie, F1K gained prominence in this era, under the new names of Peace and Alert. Notably pivoting from raiding to roaming, they were one of the biggest advocates of the main scene, and helped extend its ranks in active recruitment, which would transfer many of these players into a long-term commitment to the main scene. Jacob, the co-leader of F1K, had this story to tell. A large majority of people have at least been in F1K once. Watched a lot of people grow. I've been playing so long, and obviously you have some younger people in your group, and it's just crazy because you get to watch them grow up and to be adults and become more mature. There's a lot of fun. I think, personally, left F1K in a good name. Ken remained a formidable presence, as fierce as ever, he transitioned from Dot to Ego, in a bid to enhance the clan's reputation, and played a pivotal role in many controversies as the years unfolded. How did all of you die? How? Whoever has the- Shut the, the fuck up, old man. Shut the fuck up, retard. Don't Get fucking up. speak. Don't so, fucking speak. Yeah. For the Europeans in 2019, their community could be considered to be more active than North America in some instances. With the rise of Pete95 as their main commentator and community leader, Pete had played alongside Tonza and Nico in his early years from 2016, where he would go to start his first clan, RM, Roadman, in 2017. And with the decline of Rust leaderboards, Pete95 became immensely powerful with his approach to drama for pushing a North American versus European war among the clans, which was further publicized with his team Pi and the Pi News Network. Jack Shepard, I run the EU scene, you don't, you're NA, I'm EU, there's a difference, we're more superior. The EUs will win, even if it means I fly to America and bury this hatchet in your fucking head. Another prominent figure who'd migrated from Europe to North American servers was Marsley, who ran the French team known as Logitech, would join alongside Nico to learn his ways. Marsley later launched Bully, that commanded respect on both European and North American shores. In Oceania, after witnessing a decline in competition, we experienced a renaissance with the emergence of Southeast Asia Main, where due to regional issues with ping on North American and European servers, the Aussies and New Zealanders would now be put on the playing field with players from China, South Korea, Japan, and Thailand. This melding of cultures and tactics led to an exhilarating era for Rust Relasia Asia. Familiar faces like Tacular and Tesla would make a return, now of their main opponent being R.I., led by Kane, who over the time of their absence from the Oceana clan scene, became an opponent to reckon with. As the battles brewed, another force emerged in Southeast Asia scene, known as ICE, run by Apologize CH. While many English-speaking viewers might be unfamiliar with him, today he's one of the biggest high-content creators on YouTube for Rust. During the war and the blare for all this newfound drama, a more wholesome experience was happening on the beaches of this server for the widely renowned Teacher Steve, who is an English teacher living in Japan, thought Russ would be a great median for teaching the players from Southeast Asia the language of English. Teacher Steve was widely trolled, but was loved for his reactions and showing the more wholesome experiences within Rust. You can kill people all you like. I don't care. You know, you can uh, tease them, you can make fun with them, but um, just try not to swear if you can. Okay, guys? Back on the North American front, Horse Gang became an iconic presence with the clan community. In playing one wipe, Blake Gibson and his team would be killed by a mysterious figure called the Donald. The Donald was fully equipped with heavy armor and was observed to be riding around on a horse with an automatic shotgun. 
The Donald would go to build several great walls and could fully recite the art of war. Blake Gibson and his friends were intrigued by the Donald and wanted to know how he played. The Donald refused and a feud broke out between the two. After several months of fighting, the Donald would eventually agree to show his ways. With this newfound knowledge, Horse Gang would be at its peak and running up to players on 10 to 20 horses and killing them in heavy armor, crippling the nerf of slow movement speed and accuracy. With so many individuals fighting, the heavy armor was never expected to be used in this manner. Horse Gang would go to terrorize every official North American server, and the main scene would begin to hate these individuals. But to the surprise of many, a very popular YouTuber and former main scene player, H. June, would go to voice his concerns, which would likely have a great impact on the meta's eventual fall. Called us Horse Gang, and he's like, let's go Horse Gang, I can't believe you fucking, like, you clean that fight up with ZZZ or whatever. And fucking, from then on, that's what we called ourselves. Because we wanted to make sure that everybody had seen us before it got nerfed, because we knew, obviously, it was going to get nerfed eventually, with all the streamers being so pissed off at us. And one of those wipes, we were on, like, Rusty, Rusty Moose bi-weekly, and H. June is playing, and, like, and literally as we're on the way to take Brad, he kills somebody for an AK kit, and then we take Brad in our spot, but he, like, comes up, gets killed, freaks out, says that we were stream sniping him, and it's like, don't even say their name in the chat, guys, don't even say their name in the chat. And then like a week after that is when it got banned. So I don't know about y'all, but I've always thought H. June was the guy that with the ends. Shortly afterwards, the horse gang meta was removed by face punch and the team faded into the good night. By the summer of 2019, players sought new excitement beyond Rust traditional gameplay. Nico would go to lead this charge with the high demand of private duels for clans. This is where scrim time came into play, where this discord would gain massive popularity in hosting scrim matches on UKN. While the idea gained traction, it faced resistance from smaller clans outside of the protective confines of the Wokeville community, who were not allowed to play unless they were approved. With the Scrim Time Discord being infiltrated a few months after release, Viper, the leader of 5k, capitalized on this moment, launching official scrims that welcomed all players. This fast-paced format, coupled with the rise of tournaments like TC Wars from Aussie, evolved into base invaders, and finally Twitch rivals Rust Game Battle. This signified a shift in clan interest, away from conventional Rust gameplay. These would be some of the last cherished moments for the main scene in 2019. As for the first time in the history of the main scene, the clan competition began to recede globally. Compounding this downturn was the third rise of scripting, taking the scene by storm. Once renowned players were now under suspicion of scripting, drama ensued, friendships were broken, many players chose to turn a blind eye, unaware or perhaps in denial of the foundations eroding beneath them. The fall of the scene became evident with the rise of MLI Clan, led by Dreamer, who is respected by many players for being an esports player from Rainbow Six Siege, would now go to recruit members from IB and other highly respected teams, and began scripting and cheating to have a competitive edge over the scene. This demoralized many players, as now once very respected veterans felt it was appropriate that since many of their friends were cheating, they could follow suit, shattering a long-standing clan code of ethics against cheating. The priority now shifted from maintaining integrity to avoid getting caught. But with, but when you're full bloodied up, it doesn't if matter. I had, if I had 120 FPS every fight, dude, I wouldn't script, because like on main, no one's gonna have this recoil. Taikisha and Dreamer. <laughs> While MLI eventually faced dissolution, with many of its players banned, Dreamer would return to her career of esports in Apex Legends, leaving behind the main scene in a sad place from where it once was. As 2019 drew to a close, it was evident that ZZZ, led by Nico, OT under the leadership of Tanza, and IB, headed by Prometheus, were North America's elite teams. Apologize CH's team, ICE, emerged as Southeast Asia's best team in the Oceania main scene. For the continent of Europe, Dotburn, run by Mason, a player who played with Tanza and Nico, could be considered to have one of the most resounding teams for 2019. But these rankings cannot be taken as cleanly as facts as they once were with the pandemic of cheating, as even notable teams such as NM had some of their best original players banned, such as Caesar, Nige Smalls, and Chogster from 2018, and Dot Burn would witness a similar fate with many new recruits being banned from cheating as the clan progressed, alongside many of the corrupted players who had left IB. 
By the year's end, the Bloody Mouse still prevalent was officially banned by Face Punch, rendering the mouse useless for Rust. Good players turned cheaters were now persistent to keep their newly found titles and began to find other ways to cheat beyond the mice. With all these issues, the clan scene drastically declined, leaving many wondering about the future of a once thriving community. 2020 proved challenging for many, the onset of COVID reshaping our daily lives. Though quarantine meant more time indoors, many hoped this would rejuvenate the Rust clan scene. Sadly, numerous foundational players began transitioning to other games. Age and real-world commitments sidelined many, with a shared sentiment that Rust was heading down a less desirable path. For those who still carried on, pivoted to the new generation of servers like Stevius and Upsurge, managed by Cypher, and promoted by famous Rust YouTubers like Stevie and Surge, modded servers became all the rage, catering to a younger demographic, many from the TikTok generation, who craved an easier yet competitive Rust experience. The move became a popular term, referencing players who'd rallied their server communities on Discord enticing opponents to shift to another active server. Clans like WK, Smackers, Forever, 2Tap, and Gank carried the torch of this new generation. Having seen the main scene in its golden era, they drew upon their experiences from official servers to establish successful clans. On the iconic servers such as Rustified, Rustopia, and Rusty Moose, clans desperately sought rivals to engage with, but enthusiasm was lacking. Although player counts reached unprecedented numbers, these servers lacked the intense competition that had characterized them just a year earlier. Wild Mike became an emblem for the destruction of this era. Known for his trolling and inciting antics, he blended the mischief of Nickly45 and Cisco, frequently targeting groups for reactions further deepening the wounds. In February, Rust Relasia, one of the oldest servers in the main scene, was stripped of its official status. This monumental shift signaled the end of its clan community that had thrived since 2015. Many were shocked that such a giant server like Rust Relasia could be removed from its rankings. The removal resulted from multiple issues. Face Punch believed Rust Relasia was neglecting its responsibilities, from delayed updates and flawed server plugins to questionable monetization tactics, such as fabricating queues. Many would go to blame Razael, the owner of Rust Relasia, for his poor leadership and management of his servers. At the end of the server's life, all server permissions were limited by administrators, meaning Razael was the only one who could manage the server and was often absent when issues appeared. In making matters worse, Razael had gone to build an unprofessional environment for his server administration, where from the beginning, Razael used his admin privileges while playing on his servers. Freeze! 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 What are you doing? And would eventually decide to stream his banning waves alongside Komomo, where they would go to ban cheaters, evaders, and anyone associated with those groups. Many considered this to be a problematic practice, as this was streamed live to players where they now could get an in-game advantage in watching the streams to take the loot gathered from these now-banned players. Rust Relasia was already on thin ice for where it stood with Face Punch, and a few administrators from Rust Relasia would go to break that ice, where Officer Jake would raid Tacular using a game exploit to access his cave base on a Face Punch server. Padme would go to ban Patty Maz, a Face Punch employee from Rust Relasia, and for the straw that broke the camel's back, Zora and a few other administrators would go to find one of the original Rust YouTubers, Sir Winner, on another Oceana Face Punch server, where they seemed to be coordinating targeted attacks on him, negatively impacting Sir Winner's ability to produce content. This rightful outrage alarmed Face Punch. Already with a laundry list of grievances from the Oceana community, Rust Relasia was removed from its official status, and as of 2023, no longer operates. It's likely none of these individuals started with the intentions to behave in this manner, but with Razael not enforcing a good code of ethics, it was a sad sight to see the fall of a once great server and community. Many clans still tried their best in the dark times. Under Marsley's leadership, Bully upheld their tradition of fierce competition. Even with the downfall of the clan scene, they established themselves as one of the best clans in North America and in Europe. QM, who had quickly risen through the ranks with their leader Brandino, stood to be a strong adversary in the European domain, but it would later turn out that many players in their group were cheating. Even with their wins in 2020, it's questionable to say if they were well-deserved for the events that would follow in the years to come. As Rust Relasia ceased to exist, it is hard to call who was the best without there being much activity in 2020. But a prominent group that stood out was Poke, being run by popular clan YouTubers such as Rev, Motion, and Tacular, a smaller PvP team which was shown to be one of the best contenders of 2020, showing the decline in strength and competition for when we would see Sin, TGB, and NM years earlier.
During the summer of 2020, a shadow cast over the once vibrant main scene. Many prominent clans vanished. There was no more news coverage for clans with the retirement of Rust leaderboards, where many believed Shepherd's Villa would close its doors forever. The integrity of competition was cast into doubt, as the increasing prevalence of cheating blurred the lines between genuine skill and unfair advantage among both new and veteran players. The influx of new players overpowered the veterans, leading to a dwindling effort and transferring the accumulated knowledge, causing many to lose interest in joining a once flourishing clan scene. Gameplay mechanics shifted too. The infinite sleeping bag meta diminished the incentives for clans to raid or roam. Opponents could respawn in mere moments, putting most encounters to the chance of luck. So was this the end of the clan scene? From nothing to a hard-earned competitive community, looked to be phasing into the distance. The remaining clan members saw that, and urgency was presented to preserve the culture and community they had once loved. So the remaining few gathered to build a plan to save their community. Nico looked to be retired of Rust, gaming more casually, enjoyed spending his time with friends on new games, as he no longer felt the need to keep his title for a community that no longer existed. It was during this vacation, Nico would begin to receive more requests day after day to return to the scene not as a clan leader, but a server owner. If the clans wanted to keep what they had built, they would need to make their own centralized server. Nico, being a witness and a highly respected member since the beginning of the clan community, had what it took to make it happen. Nico had returned, with great promises to keep the community alive, and would go to start the widely popular Vital Rust. Doubts persisted. Earlier attempts by Rustoria and Rusty Luck had tried to start a clan-oriented server in the past, and it had never come to be. With Vital being modded with many quality-of-life features, many speculated whether Nico's unconventional approach would thrive. Finally, the moment had come. The server had wiped. To the surprise of many, everyone came to play. Nico would load in to see the joy of his friends and enemies praise in the chat. And for that one wipe, it was pure bliss from the suffering for the past year. Five years of collective experience converged in that moment. Many reflected in awe at their united effort of clans to preserve a legacy painstakingly crafted over years of gameplay. A wholesome ending for the clan scene. But was this really the end? I'm gonna fucking sell the cheapest goddamn sheets. Listen to me, fucking idiots! No. Thank you.